forgot to do that. How's that? Is that better? Oh, much better. Much better. Yeah. yeah. I kind of like that hangman's look, though. I sort of like that. Yeah. <laughs> You're in your cave. <laughs> okay. So, Lorel, looks like it's uh, live streaming, so it looks like we should be good. Yep. There's a slight delay, and I was just waiting for it to catch up. Okay, so uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, our program today is COVID-19 update, Are We Any Closer to the End, with Dr. George Rutherford. Rutherford. Um, I'm Laurel Climier. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Piedmont, and I really appreciate you all taking the time out of your afternoon to be with us today. Um, and before we get to the introduction of our speaker, um, I just wanted to go over a few logistics. So if you're on the Zoom call with us, please um, keep yourself muted for the duration of the event to minimize um, background noise. And you can post your questions for our speaker now or at any time during the presentation, either through uh, the Zoom chat, if you're on the Zoom call with us in the comments on YouTube, or you can email them to lwvpmont at gmail.com. And uh, after Dr. Rutherford's presentation, I will get through as many of them as I can. Obviously, no guarantees there. And um, if you're joining us on YouTube, uh, I request that you subscribe and click the bell to get notifications of future live stream events. And if you'd like advanced notification of our events, um, you can go to our website, which is www.lwvpiedmont.org, and you can also join the league there. Your membership helps support our efforts in voter education and advocacy, including lead ag advocacy, not just locally, but at the state and national level. So it's extremely important work that the league is doing now um, to uh, make democracy work. and. Uh, we would appreciate your support. So without um, delaying any further, I will turn things over to Jennifer Trainer, who is our uh, one of our program committee chairs, and she will introduce the program. Okay, thanks, Laurel. Well, we are delighted to welcome Dr. George Redford back to our speaker series today. His first appearance with us was on May 6th, which seems like an eternity ago. That event was so well attended that that's why we live stream now is because we blew out uh, the Zoom capacity very quickly in that event. So uh, thanks to you, George, we're, we're um, now on live stream as well. Uh, as Laurel said today, Dr. Rutherford is gonna help us understand where we are with COVID now, where we're headed, what's going on with the vaccine and so forth. Uh, to most of you, Dr. Rutherford needs no introduction. He is an internationally renowned epidemiologist and has been featured almost daily in the media throughout this whole COVID period. And happily for us, he's also a Piedmont resident. Dr. Rutherford leads the Global Strategic Information Group within UCSF's Institute for Global Health Sciences. He's the Salvatore Pablo Lucia Professor of Epidemiology, Preventive Medicine, Pediatrics and History. He's also head of the Division of Infectious Disease and Global Epidemiology at UCSF and Professor of Epidemiology and Health Administration in the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley. He is a principal investigator of a series of CDC cooperative agreements that support countries in Africa and Asia. He serves as an advisor to the World Health Organization, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV and AIDS and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, um, Tuberculosis and Malaria. He's past chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics section on epidemiology and was the chair of the first chair of the Department of Veterans Affairs Research Advisory Council. Um, Dr. Rutherford's resume is so extensive that it actually took me over a half hour to try and this is a di small distillation of his many talents. Um, he served at the state level, also in New York City. We couldn't have someone more qualified to speak to us. George, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with us again. And thank you on behalf of all of us for the tremendous service that you've provided to the greater community during COVID. So over to you. You're far too kind, far too kind. Um, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see everyone here, friends and neighbors. And um, 
Yes, that's oh, that's not only a Christmas tree, but yes, that's Crocker Avenue behind me on the uh, uh, through the through that window with all the sun streaming through. Uh, it's great to see everybody. As I said, let me share my um, let me share my screen, and we can get uh, we can get rolling. Um, the I was going to talk a little bit about epidemiology, and then a few words about vaccines, and uh, and then we can move on from there. And I'm happy to spend most of the, the bulk of the time with um, on Q and A um, worldwide. Um, hold on one second. I, there's something wrong here. Give me one second, guys. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, that's why. Wrong slide, wrong slide set. There we are. <laughs> yeah, I know these numbers so intimately, I could tell they were off. Um, but uh, there was, that was last, that, that was two days ago. Um, let me get the, let me get the right ones here. Um, so it's, as I said, it's really good to see everybody. So this is all, this is largely a good news uh, talk. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the good news is, is that we have these vaccines that are really remarkable. This is a true feat in the history of science. Uh, and uh, we're all going to benefit from them sooner, much sooner than, uh, than later. There we go. That's the right, those are the right guys. Uh, worldwide, there've been 88 million cases of, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection reported. Remember SARS-CoV-2 is the infectious agent. It's a coronavirus. And uh, the, the disease it, co it causes is uh, COVID-19, the clinical disease it causes. So if you don't have any symptoms, we talk, to, we talk about SARS-CoV-2 infection. You have symptoms, we talk about COVID-19. We use SARS-CoV-2 infection as the sort of the larger term to en encompass both. Uh, worldwide, there have been 88 uh, uh, million cases uh, reported uh, with almost 5 million uh, last week. This is, uh, as you can see, it's, it's still going up, although it's starting to flatten out uh, a bit. Um, there were uh, um, oh, almost 2 million deaths worldwide last week, uh, overall, uh, since the beginning, and about 85,000 um, last week. The largest numbers of cases are now occurring in the Americas, which is mostly the US, but also Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Canada all have large, uh, large outbreaks followed by uh, Europe uh, with the UK, Germany, France, um, and Spain having the bulk of the uh, cases. There are relatively few case cases in South and Southeast Asia. These are almost all in India. Uh, here in the Eastern Mediterranean, this are, the bulk of these cases are in Iran. In Africa, the bulk of the cases are in South Africa. And in the Western Pacific, which includes um, uh, China, uh, the People's Republic of China, um, this is their outbreak back in back in there. So you can see how small it was relative to what's happened uh, worldwide. And uh, in the last uh, last week, these are the cases in the last seven days. The U.S. Uh, has four times as much as the next highest country, which is the U.K., then Brazil, Russia, um, and India. In the United States, um, there have been 22.6 million cases. Uh, we are consistently running over 200,000 new cases per day. Um, there has been some modest turn down, very modest. Um, and this is, we're getting the impression that this is starting to flatten out. These are dips from Thanksgiving uh, and then kind of Christmas and New Year's ho holidays. Uh, Hawaii is the only state in which cases are not surging and uh, SARS for, for, 20, uh, for the 2020, uh, uh, COVID-19 was the third leading cause of death in the United States and on seven and it became the uh, for the month of December it was the leading cause of death and on seven days in December I think this is quite remarkable the number of deaths from COVID-19 exceeded the number of deaths from cancer plus cardiovascular disease uh, combined which are which are the two leading causes of death um, there have been uh, almost uh, there have been 370, more than 376,000 total deaths, and we're uh, running uh, right now at a clip of around um, 2,000 deaths per day on uh, on average. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is the, the average is here up about 3,200, and uh, yesterday, I'm sorry, this was on Monday. It was 2,000 cases. 
California is a bit is a, has a similar, if uh, not, but maybe slightly different uh, picture. Uh, a lot with all this reporting artifact with, from cases that you know from uh, periods when people didn't go to get tested, and then all the tests got done on the next day and batched together. You get this um, really sawtooth pattern, but you get the impression that this is starting to turn over and and, and go down. Um, we've had as many as uh, uh, 70, more than 70,000 cases in a single day reported. Uh, we're running at an average of about uh, slightly more than 40,000 cases uh, per day um, and uh, about uh, a little more than 400 deaths uh, per day, uh, which is an extraordinary number. The U.S. deaths, by the way, um, this total number is greater than all U.S. combat deaths in World War II. If you look at where these are going on, this is all about Southern California, and it's really all about Los Angeles and the, and the communities around Los Angeles and the San Bernardino and Orange and Riverside, and Ventura is the sixth on this list, and then San Diego has its own, uh, own outbreaks and own problems. This has gone up so rapidly uh, since um, uh, this is uh, here is January 12th, but you can see how rapidly this has been going up since um, really before Thanksgiving, this is this little dip in here is Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, I, I think the one thing to say is that uh, if you look at the, how fast it accelerated after Thanksgiving kind of here and how fast it accelerated after Christmas and now after New Year's, it, it's starting really to flatten out a little bit, but you know, that's just, you know, that's all games playing with numbers. Um, there's still a ton of transmission going on half of which, by the way, is in Los Angeles. Here in the Bay Area, uh, we have had over 300,000 cases uh, and on Monday had more than 5,000 um, and uh, 3,000, more than 3,000 total deaths. And we run at a clip of around, um, somewhere around 50 deaths per day. So 30 was a bit of an understatement. Um, Here's the uh, numbers of, uh, this shows you what's going on in each county here. The point is that it's going up in all counties here, except Santa Clara, where it's been far and away the worst in terms of total uh, cases. Um, Alameda has 60,000 total cases and 736 total deaths. I didn't look up what Piedmont had today, but I think it's something around 130 cases. Um, <clears throat> and here you can see the percentage uh, uh, change. This is the number of cases per day per 100,000 uh, people uh, in, in a period of time, a seven day period a week ago. So it gets rid of all this kind of reporting lag and stuff. And this is what the state follows to ascertain whether, uh, uh, whether uh, businesses can open and close, schools can open and close. This is the number they follow, uh, one of the numbers. And um, the, the break point here is at seven per 100,000 per day. That's when you move from the highest tier or the purple tier until it uh, to the next highest tier, which is red. And that's at seven. And you can see San Francisco is the closest and it's still two and a half times that. Uh, Marin is the only other one that's kind of down here in, in this range. And the, the governor has set a goal of 28 per 100,000 as the number uh, uh, for cases in which to consider elementary school reopening. So you can see <clears throat> none of these counties, including Alameda, uh, meets that criterion. San Francisco and Marin do, but you can see Solano, Sonoma, Napa don't either. Um, <clears throat> the other number we follow, this is a bit of a complex epidemiologic construct, but it's called the effective reproductive number. And it means the number of cases that uh, each primary case uh, accounts for. Um, and it's so it's the, so if, uh, if I'm infected, so if 10 people are infected and they infect 14 people, the R sub E is 1.4, right? So imagine if it were two, so one infects two, those two infect two, those two infect two, those two infect two, that's how you get exponential growth. We want this to be at one, at least at one or below one, um, because then you sort of gradually extinguish transmission. And you can see San Francisco is at 1.14. Alameda is actually doing a really good job and it's under uh, 0.1 now, but it really flutters around this uh, 1.0 number. So the, the ones that are the outliers here are San Francisco and Marin, which suggests that their um, 
you know, that they're going to kind of catch up with these other numbers here fairly soon. Now, the governor uh, and whose speech writers didn't live in the 1960s uh, created a new tier within the purple tier, which they have unfortunately called the deep purple tier. Um, now, I, I dare you to remember a couple of deep purple songs, but, um, you know, it was a 60s, a late 60s uh, band um, it had such hits, hits as Hush, as I recall. Um, but that's another, that's a story for another day. Um, the state is, so what they've done with this is they've divided the state into five regions, which is Southern California, basically San Luis Obispo, and then up the Owens Valley, right? Um, it, with, I'm sorry, but not including Kern. And then this, the uh, Central Valley, which is Kern up and through about, about to San Joaquin, then the kind of greater Sacramento area, the Bay Area, which includes Monterey and Santa Cruz, and then Northern California, which is everybody from uh, Mendocino kind of up and over. That's not part of uh, greater Sacramento. This is essentially the state of Jefferson for those of you who follow true Northern California politics. Um, statewide, there have been 91.7 cases per 100,000 per day. That gives you an idea of how much disease there is down here in Southern California. We also follow the proportion of all tests that are positive. Uh, statewide, it's, uh, it, the average over the last uh, seven days has been 17.8%. Um, and overall, we have, a, a, in San Francisco, by the way, I know this one off the top of my head, is 5.5%. So it's really very different in Northern California than Southern California. Overall, um, there's essentially no ICU bed capacity uh, in the state. Now, this is, doesn't mean that there's no ICU capacity. This is a kind of complicated metric that the state dreamt up that I think is fairly misleading. But it starts off, the way this works is they, it starts off to say, we think on any given day, you, can only, you should only have 30% of your beds occupied by COVID patients in the ICUs. And that 70% is with everything else you know, heart attacks, broken hips, gunshot wounds, car wrecks, strokes, uh, cancer surgeries, you know, complex uh, orthopedic surgeries, that sort of stuff, okay? So that with 30% is okay to have, all right? And then they take away points for every bed above the 30%. And what 0% means is that more than 60% of the beds in a region are, are um, occupied by COVID-19 patients. Um, so both San Joaquin Valley and Southern California are at zero. Um, greater Sacramento's at 9.7. We drop down in the Bay Area, which again includes all the way down to Monterey, to 0.7, um, which means kind of translating that into real numbers. It means that 50, you know, about 57% of all our beds are being used by 58% of all our beds are being used by COVID patients. I have a, a really close colleague at Stanford. We talk to her every day and she said on Saturday, it was just helicopters constantly flying patients in. Um, we're starting to transport patients from Southern California to Northern California. I can tell you last summer in the, in the midst of the big surge in Southern California, we had patients from Imperial County in both UCSF and San Francisco, sorry, Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Statewide, the uh, effective reproductive rate is 1.05, which is not horrible, but it's not, it, we, we really want, it really needs to be below one. Now, what's wrong with this picture? This is the Saturday before Christmas on Regent Street in London. Mask, no mask, no mask, no mask. I guess that's a muffler. Um, no mask. You can see, you know, look down these faces. There's a mask. There's a mask, but it's really very spotty. Okay. This is a crowd. Okay. This is the sorts of times we tell you to try to avoid, um, especially when people aren't wearing masks, like most of the people here. It was no surprise that there was a big surge up in cases um, in London or around Christmas. But it turns out that it was even more complicated than people not wearing masks there was a new variant of COVID-19 that's more transmissible uh, that was associated with this uh, increase. And right now it's accounting for about 20% of all new infections in greater London and 
southeastern um, England. This is a, a, a specific uh, variant of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that has accumulated 17 mutations, 14 of which are structural. Um, there's some thought that children may be more susceptible, but what the report actually says is people under 20, uh, and it doesn't differentiate it any further than that. Um, this is probably because of one of these uh, one of these very uh, uh, mutations. It probably binds more efficiently to the receptors on the cell sites that we talked about last time. Um, but on the other hand, it may have actually be uh, it has a deletion here that may make it somewhat less severe. But on balance, it's certainly more transmissible. There, but there is no evidence of more severe disease no evidence of, of resistance to the vaccines that we're currently using, uh, no evidence that it, we can't detect it by our current um, technologies, and there's no evidence that it's resistant to the monoclonal antibodies that we use uh, therapeutically. So it's a kind of good news, bad news story, but it's a really cautionary tale. Um, in the United States, and part of it is that Britain does, really good, does a good job of looking for these things. In the U.S., We've done a less good job of looking for them. Now we're all whipped into a frenzy over this um, and are starting to find cases uh, all over the country, which bespeaks probably fairly widespread transmission. Of the, of the 32 cases in California, something like 28 are in San Diego County. And it's not all over San Diego County. It's sort of in the Eastern uh, suburbs like El Cajon, La Mesa, Lakeside, Spring Valley, those, place, those kinds of places. Uh, and then there are 22 cases in Florida. So not the world's best news, uh, but again, um, susceptible to current vaccines, susceptible to current therapy. Now I'm just gonna say a few words about vaccination. Um, there are four approaches to vaccines um, that are being pursued here. Uh, they're the uh, ones that use RNA and DNA technology to trick cells into producing large numbers of the spike protein. Let's see, let me go back here for a second. This, this thing that sticks off this edge of the, uh, of the uh, viral, um, of the virus, right? This is what antibodies are directed to. This is what the immune system recognizes. So we, we can use RNA or DNA to, to get, uh, to trick a cell into just producing the spike proteins, not the whole virus, just the proteins. We can use uh, uh, so-called vectored vaccines where we use different viruses, not the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but a, a different virus that we've re-engineered to include a little piece of um, RNA in it um, that can get taken up by a host cell and then do the have the same basically the same effect is that it cranks out um, lots of these little spike proteins which are completely non-pathogenic but the immune system recognizes them. We can just give you the little spike protein itself. Those are protein vaccines. This is the technology we use for hepatitis B service. I'm sorry, hepatitis B vaccine. And then we can use inactivated or attenuated vaccines. Inactivated vaccines are things like, um, uh, are, are things like uh, the, uh, the, salt or the, uh, the salt vaccine, um, uh, which is the inactivated polio virus vaccine. So you take the whole virus, you kill it typically in formalin, and then you just inject its carcass. And it has enough of the structural integrity with the, with the pieces sticking off, although it, um, the RNA is no longer active, so it can't reproduce, but you see the whole, the whole virus and you make antibodies to the whole virus. Or you can have vaccines where the virus has been changed, uh, basically made less uh, or non-pathogenic, or non less pathogenic or non-pathogenic. That's the technology with the oral polio vaccine, um, for instance. Uh, and also with smallpox vaccine for that, for that matter. Uh, so here's all the vaccines that have been, um, we've been uh, uh, living with, trying to keep track of. Uh, there are 43 of these vaccines worldwide in phase one trials, which is where you try and get, try and understand with the safety profile and try and get the doses right. Uh, there are 20 in phase two trials, which are expanded uh, beyond phase one. This is where you get early indications of whether they work or not. There are 20 in, in large uh, phase three efficacy trials. And by large, I mean 30,000 participants in these trials. Um, seven vaccines have been approved uh, for limited use within their own, um, within their own countries. 
uh, or within uh, selected countries. Three have re received full approval for full use. Okay. Two of these are the US vaccines we're using and one is a Russian vaccine. And then we have one that was abandoned after the trials. This actually gave false positive HIV antibody results, which is a little problem. This was an Australian vaccine. Um, but here's the leading uh, uh, vaccines. And you can see here, these are using mRNA vac uh, technology. This ad thing is for adenovirus. These are viral vectored vaccines where this is the vector. They're using adenovirus 26 and adenovirus 5. Okay. This has received um, uh, emergency use in Belarus and a few other countries like Argentina and someplace. Um, these are human adenoviruses they're using as the vector. AstraZeneca, a Swedish company do, do, uh, that partnered with Oxford University is using a kind of similar kind of technology, but with ch a chimpanzee, that's what CH here is, a chimpanzee uh, adenovirus. So presumably there's not a lot of immunity to that already in human populations. The concern with these adenovirus vectored vaccines is that a large proportion of the population has immunity to them and they'll kill them right off the bat. You'll never, they'll never be able to really replicate. Same problems here. Um, these are the protein vaccines. Novavax is something um, that might actually get out of the starting blocks in the US. Um, and then some of these other ones. Um, so uh, there have been uh, limited use in, um, uh, in China, but also in some of the um, uh, Arabian Peninsula uh, countries. If you wanna get this one, you have to join the People's Liberation Army. So that might be a bit of a high bar for most people. Um, and then these are the, uh, the ones that have been approved, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. These are the ones we're giving in Alameda County today. There are three more that are in trials, uh, uh, these genetic vaccines um, that are in trials. Um, but the idea here is that you give an mRNA, um, a messenger RNA, and not to, uh, not to um, force you too far down the uh, memory lane in biology. But if you were to give somebody mRNA, it never enters the nucleus of the cell. Okay, so you got the virus here. You got the human cell here, a respiratory cell, right? Cell on the respiratory epithelium. The virus binds onto it like that. It's actually much more complicated than that, but it binds onto it and it injects its, uh, its RNA into it. Viruses have, these viruses have RNA, okay? That's how that, uh, that's how that worked. That, R, that RNA in a, uh, in, a typical, um, in a typical infection will go into the nucleus, get incorporated into the nucleus, and then crank out proteins that will be made to make more virus. What this vaccine does is you got the piece of RNA that comes along, right? That gets taken up by the cell, right? It then goes to the ribosomes, which are the little factories where proteins are made, which are outside of the nucleus. So the mRNA from these RNA vaccines never enters the nucleus of the cell. So it's not intercalated, it's not uh, picked, taken up into the host genetic material. It is for DNA vaccines, but for these RNA vaccines, it isn't. So that's why everybody says they're so safe because they stay outside of the nucleus. And so we're not gonna see weird untoward effects. We have had some anaphylaxis and that's not to the RNA, mRNA particles, it's to other things in the, uh, in the vaccine. But these are the two we have um, there are some handling differences. The Pfizer BioNTech, which is a German company, um, uh, has to be uh, stored at minus 70 degrees centigrade. So, which is something that we do in the university bi bio biology research laboratories all the time, but it's not, you know, the Walgreens isn't gonna have it. Uh, so this becomes sort of a storage issue. This is kind of complicated to store. The other thing is this give, is given 21 days apart the third thing is, is that this is actually authorized in the United States for people from 16 up. The Moderna vaccine is authorized in the U.S. for people from 18 up. Um, this is also stored at a somewhat higher temperature, like minus 20 degrees centigrade, which is fairly reachable in, in, in many, like in a drugstore or something. Uh, and it's given 28 days apart, as I, I think I may have said that. So there's some small differences here. 
For you, it doesn't matter. Get, get whichever one you're offered, uh, the bottom line. Here are the California Department of Health guidelines. Um, they go on for two pages. Um, we're currently in phase 1A, which had three tiers until yesterday. Magic wand wave, no more three tiers. If you're on anybody oh on gosh, this list, Mango looks like she's you should be uh, you should be getting vaccinated. Okay, but this is basically all healthcare workers of whatever stripe, and um, all people living in skilled nursing facilities, assisted living f facilities, <laughs> intermediate care facilities, or receiving home health care or in-home uh, supportive services. Okay, and then tier one B. Um, is going to go, this got dropped to 65, by the way, these got consolidated as well. So it's um, individuals, at least here, it's individuals 75 and older. And then these, um, uh, this infrastructural sector, education, childcare, emergency services, and food and agriculture. And then their tier two or 65 to 74 year olds. Um, and then a bunch of other kind of essential industries. And then tier uh, phase one C, are 50 to 64 year olds, 16 to 64 year olds with an underlying condition, and then some other kind of essential uh, workers. This is way complicated, right? Um, and uh, I can tell you there's a real move just to make this 65 and older first. Now, interestingly, if you were to ask uh, if a federally approved vaccine for COVID was available for you today, would you take it as soon as possible, blah, blah, blah. So 78% of people say they would take it, right? Uh, but as of the last Friday, um, only about two and a half percent of, of adults had been vaccinated in, um, in California. Um, so we're pushing, I'm sorry, this is, should be 734,000. I don't know why I got to have been vaccinated in California. Um, this is being, there's a real full court press going on to get now to get people uh, vaccinated. So you ask, how do you get vaccine? That's the right question. Um, and it's going to largely go out through existing providers and health systems. Larger counties uh, are setting up sites that can administer up to 5,000 doses per day. Uh, and that includes in Southern California, my favorite Disneyland, uh, but also Dodger Stadium and uh, Petco Field, which is where the San Diego Padres play, which is a mystery to me because there's no parking within 100 blocks of there. But that's okay. Um, the, and the uh, state fairgrounds in Sacramento, you can bet that they're, you know, sizing up uh, Alameda County Stadium uh, parking lot, sort of whatever we call that these days, Oracle uh, uh, parking lots, and uh, maybe a few other places. But most of you are going to get it through your health systems. So know where you are on the on the phases and the tiers, uh, and then uh, you should go be looking towards your healthcare providers. Uh, for those of you who receive your health care through the California Department of Corrections, which we refer to as the other CDC. Uh, but, you know, Kaiser has, is giving doses out to tier one, uh, 1A right now. Um, and uh, so are these others. We, we pretty much work through our population at UCSF. But they're going to mo start moving to people, to, to covered people who are over 65 in all of these health care systems. So I'll stop there. And I think that's what you, I hope that's what you guys wanted to know about. And I can come back and fill in all sorts of detail uh, for questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Rutherford for the presentation. We have a bunch of questions about um, vaccines and a handful sort of about underlying um, things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna save the vaccines for after the the more basic questions yeah um so when you were going over the the numbers in the beginning of the presentation mm -hmm. do you do you think the numbers are understated how accurate do you think the numbers are both for cases and and deaths um i think they're uh i think they're very accurate um the actual number of infections is obviously higher than the number of cases because people who don't get, remember 40% of people, I, th I think we went over this last time, so I tried not to repeat myself, but 40% of people get no symptoms at all. So if you don't have any symptoms, you're not gonna get tested unless somebody in your household gets, uh, is recognized and gets diagnosed. So there's gonna be an undercount by, by some large factor to start with just because people don't present for testing. 
So I say you'd have to double it uh, for uh, to get kind of a start getting a more accurate picture of how many people are truly infected. Um, I think the death counts are uh, are as accurate as they as they can be now. Early on, there was a real undercounting of deaths, um, especially with with the large number of deaths in in long term care facilities and nursing homes um, in the east, uh, and just not diagnosing people uh, with a COVID as a cause cause of death. Right now, I think it's plenty accurate, uh, but nationally, we think there might be as much as a twenty percent undercount of COVID as a cause of death. Uh, and then there are also additional deaths too that are you know dis, that are secondarily attributable to COVID. So people who didn't go to the ER with chest pain because they were afraid they were gonna get, get COVID and then die at home of a myocardial infarction. Or I can tell you that there's a, in Germany, there are the number of, of new adolescent diabetics um, who, who were identified went way down and that's gonna be a constant in the population, right? Um, and so the next quarter you find the ones that are presenting in extremis um, uh, and uh, you know, that's gone, that starts to go up. So you see this kind of delayed healthcare. There's a huge problem worldwide with delays in vaccination. You see these delays in healthcare that are eventually gonna cost lives as well. Okay. For the people who do end up in the ICU, um, do we have demographic and other information about them, uh, age information, um, whether there were comorbidities? Like what is the risk of your ending or the chance of your ending up in the ICU when you contract the virus? Uh, so uh, overall, if you have, let's just talk about cases right now, recognized cases. About 15% of recognized cases will end up in the hospital and a third of those will end up in the ICU. If you end up in the ICU, currently uh, something like 90% of people walk out of the ICU. So the care is that good now. And it, it, it's gone up from 40% to 90% of the people walk out of the ICUs. Um, the people who have, who have rapidly progressive disease, there are a number of risk factors or comorbidities, um, which include, you know, cardiovascular disease and hypertension and diabetes and, and uh, cancer, on, having chemotherapy, solid organ transplants, um, morb uh, morbid obesity, blah, 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 long list. Um, but number one on the list is age. And the age, uh, if you're over 70, your, your risk is, uh, let's see, your risk is something like 930 times higher than if you're in your 20s. So it's a, you know, age is a huge risk factor for this, which is why um, we try and vaccinate people over 65 first. In some states, because there's been you know minimal federal leadership on this point, um, in some states like Florida, they're not vaccinating any healthcare workers. They're just vaccinating everybody over 65 and have created these lines of long lines of people, you know, sitting in lawn chairs, waiting to get vaccinated. I heard a story about somebody who was in line for 20 hours to get vaccinated. You can imagine how much transmission is gonna go on in those lines, right? That's not the way to do this. Um, I mean, it's a policy decision to try and vaccinate everybody, older people first, uh, but uh, you know, you sort of have three choices when you vaccinate people. You can vaccinate to protect infrastructure, critical infrastructure. Healthcare workers, EMTs, police, you know, grocery clerks, you know, blah, 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 blah. You can va vaccinate to protect the most susceptible, older underlying conditions, uh, the kinds of housing like prisoners that where there's ra rapid transmission. Or you can, you can vaccinate to prevent transmission to try and break the epidemic. And if you're doing that in Alameda County, you would start vaccinating everybody in the Fruitvale district first because that's where the bulk of transmission is, or that's where there's disproportionate transmission. If you're doing that at the state, you'd vaccinate everybody in Los Angeles first because that's where the bulk of transmission is. Um, but everybody's trying to do it a little, a little bit of all of those um, at the same time. Uh, but right now as a state, we're still dealing with kind of the healthcare worker and long-term care facility resident groups as the first pass. And then we'll move out to the next uh, to the next level. 
Can you talk a little bit about the safety of the vaccines? Um, I yeah. have a few questions about that. Like, is it okay for breastfeeding mothers to get the vaccine? And what about people I that who are- three times in the last two days. <laughs> what about people who are hesitant, you know, not necessarily strong anti-vaxxers, but um, along those lines who are hesitant about vaccines, what information can we give people like that to help them understand that the vaccine is safe? So the vaccine is very safe, okay? With, with the exception of uh, the risk of anaphylactic reactions, which is to the polyethylene glycol component of the vaccine, which is a sort of grease you have to, it's like antifreeze, you have grease you have to get onto the mRNA so it slips into the cells. There's been anaphylaxis to that about 10 times the rate of which we see anaphylaxis to most vaccines. By 10 times the rate, I mean one in 100,000 doses. So um, that's why they want you to wait around 15 minutes after you get your vaccine. So that's something to be concerned about. Also, when you get your vaccine, your arm's gonna be sore. And the second time you're gonna get it, you're not gonna feel good for a day or so. If you've ever had yellow fever vaccine, anybody ever had yellow fever vaccine? Same kind of thing, you don't, you don't feel great. Um, so if you're, you know, so the police forces, for instance, are all vaccinating everybody on Friday, you know, that at the, at the end of their five work days, right? So they're not, so they can get sick on their own time, you know, yeah, okay. Um, that's how they're managing that part of it. Um, so, but aside from that, it's, uh, it's safe. I have a pregnant daughter and a pregnant daughter-in-law and they've both gotten vaccinated, okay? That should tell you something right there. And, it, and if you have a few allergies and you know, blah, blah, just tell me I have allergies and they'll, they'll make you stick around. The one, one thing I'd say is an absolute contraindication is you had anaphylaxis to it the first dose then I would not get the second dose. Aside from that, I really see almost no contraindication. If you're on chemotherapy, it's not a contraindication. If you're on immunosuppressives, it's not a contraindication, okay? Get the vaccine. And what so, do you tell the anti-vaxxers? You, know, you can't tell them anything, right? Doesn't matter. Um, so if the, as, as we start moving into this, a period of time where a portion of the population will be vaccinated and a portion won't. How will that affect the way we move forward with our own precautions that we're taking now? Um, you're gonna to have to maintain precautions until we get as many people vaccinated as possible. Uh, we talk about 70% for herd immunity. Um, when you start seeing these new variants that are more rapidly transmitted, it's gonna be higher than that. Um, but you know, in point of fact, you know, once you're vaccinated, you're going to be pretty much out of the woods. Um, and I guess there's a small failure rate associated with it at about 5% in the trials. Um, but it's, you know, these are remarkable vaccines. I mean, the best vaccine we have is measles vaccine. And that has a 5% failure rate associated with it as well. Um, the other thing about these vaccines is that because there's so much COVID circulating, people are going to get re-stimulated constantly by naturally occurring exposure. So you're not gonna to have to have boosters or anything for a while, I don't think. Um, I, know, I don't think I quite answered that question now that I've forgotten what it is. You started me down that track, but, but go ahead. I'm I, think you, I think you answered it. You started off with the answer. The question was what precautions should we be taking as people start getting vaccinated? Oh, oh, you're gonna still have to wear your masks probably until we get a bunch of people. Uh, we're gonna to have to con continue the same precautions when you go out in public. You know, if you want to have your friends over for dinner who have all been vaccinated, you know, check their vaccine cards. Here's my vaccine card. I mean, this isn't a vaccine, this is a testing card. I forgot that, that's all right. But it looks about like that. My, my daughter showed me hers. It looks like a, it's, you know, it's not, it's not that impressive looking. Um, and, uh, but, you know, they're going to, it's all going to be electronically recorded as well. So, you know, when, you know, when Jennifer invites me into her fabulous house and palatial house in Napa next time, I, I can bring my vaccine certificate with me and she can t tell me not to wait at the curb. Not that she's ever done that. Don't get me wrong. But it's, uh, you know, you can start mixing. You can start mixing again as long as those people are vaccinated. It's when you go out in the public, when you go on to BART, just as an example, you, you need to be careful still because you might be one of the 5%. You don't know that, right? Um, so, 
so is the vaccine effective against all of the variations, including the new uh, variations that are uh, more highly transmissible? It, it's certainly, it's certainly uh, effective against the British variant. There's one in South Africa that we're a little concerned about where there may be enough of a, a change in the shape of the, of the spike protein that it may not be recognized as rapidly, but still it's gonna be recognized. Just to give you an idea, the, the, the avidity of antibody, how quickly it finds the spike proteins is 17 times higher in people who've gotten vaccinated than people who have naturally occurring infection. I mean, it, you know, as I said, this is truly remarkable technology and really is the, is the culmination of 70 years of research in molecular biology, going back to Watson and, and Crick and, and uh, Rosalind Franklin. Um, you know, it's just, this is truly remarkable. Um, um, you know, there's a, there's substantial thought that the influenza quote unquote um, that, uh, uh, epidemic of 1890 was in fact a coronavirus ep epidemic and killed some massive amount of people uh, worldwide. Um, and before it uh, became more attenuated and, and less pathogenic to people. Um, but the, the concern with coronaviruses is that naturally occurring immunity does not last very long. There are a bunch of coronaviruses that are part of the common cold sort of complex. Um, and immunity doesn't really last year to year. So that was the concern about this, which is why we wanted this vaccine um, that would really pr produce much more durable immunity, much more long-lived immunity. So um, this is circling back a little bit to the, the question about not being vaccinated around other people who are vaccinated, just to be clear. Um, if I'm not vaccinated, can I go visit my elderly relatives who have been vaccinated safely? I mean, I'm not putting them at risk, but I may be putting myself at risk still. What's the advice for that? Uh, we don't, it hasn't been formulated yet. My advice to that for, for that would be get vaccinated. You know, presume you're infectious unless you know otherwise. Presume that they're part of the 5% who fail vaccination unless you know otherwise. That's the conservative way to approach it. And for people here locally, what's the best way to currently get the vaccine? Is there some uh, place to sign up? Yeah, I mean, if you're, it's with through your healthcare providers. Um, if you're, if you, if you're uncovered, which I, you know, if you don't have any health insurance or you don't have a primary care physician, the county will do it. Uh, they they're still putting their plans together. I know, I know about San Francisco. I don't know much about Alameda. Sorry. Um, what's... I don't want to go to the cow palace anyway, believe me. So. <laughs> What's your prediction for how long it will take through the vaccines to get to a level of herd immunity that we would need? Uh, summer, end of summer. That's what that's if everything goes right, full court press. The manufacturing is not the rate limiting step here. It's actually getting it into arms. Uh, and for those of you who are retired uh, uh, dentists, nurses, uh, uh, physicians, um, by all means, the, you know, the state has sign, I don't know how you, where you do it, but the state has signups for people who want to be voluntary vaccinators. I would not do it until I got my first, got my first dose, by the way. Um, but I'm going to go help out <clears throat> probably. So, uh, Dr. Barbaccia, you know, you have to dust off your, dust off your uh, medical license and go down there and give it a shot, okay, so to speak. So I have a I just, few I just questions. saw you on the screen, that's all. I just A few questions about um, testing. So uh, is it advisable to be tested before you get the vaccine? No. Um, if you already if you have gotten the back vaccine and then you get an anti antibody test uh, subsequently, will that affect it? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So first of all, the only caution, there's no caution about getting the vaccine. If you've had the disease, it's just a matter of making the vaccine go farther, the available supply go farther. Uh, CDC currently says uh, 
if you've gotten back, if you've had the disease in the last three months, you can put off vaccination for a while. You'll have naturally occurring immunity that will probably be protective. Okay. But that's not about danger. That's just about making vaccine available to more people. <clears throat> Once you've been vaccinated, you're going to have a positive. It depends on which antibody test you have, but you will make antibodies. You will, if you take an antibody test that's directed at the spike protein, um, that will be positive. If you get an antibody test that's directed to the nucleus of the virus, that will be negative. Um, and uh, so you need to, first of all, there's no reason to get an antibody test uh, unless you're in one of my research studies where we're looking for reinfection. And then we test for both types. Uh, but it's, um, you know, I just, you know, there's no reason to do it. But yes, you would, you would if they did the right kind of antibody test, you would have a you would have a false positive. It's not a false positive. You have antibodies. That's what they're measuring. So once um, once you have been vaccinated, and you're assuming that still a, a fair amount of the population is not yet vaccinated, um, do you still need to take what precautions do you need to take when you're doing things like traveling or? Um, grocery shopping, you know, what, what kind of re-entry into normal going life will you be able to far, take? Going to the far-flung aisles of Trader Joe's. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> um, I, I'd still wear, you know, I, again, I think when you go out into public until we have achieved herd immunity, you have to assume that people around you are infected and infectious. Okay. Now, seven days after vaccine, after your second vaccine, you have a very high level of protection. But still, 5% of people have, have failed, okay? Have, have our vaccine failures for whatever reason. And it's probably from mishandling the vaccines, frankly. Um, and so I think you have to assume that you're part of that 5% that's uninf that, that as a vaccine failure and the person standing next to you in line is excreting virus like a fire hose. Okay? That's the best way to think about this stuff. Now, when we get to... Uh, you know, high levels of immunity and high vaccine coverage, then you think about it differently. But you're talking about very sort of marginal differences. And since my wife and I are both, you know, doctors and we're going to be probably fully vaccinated within the month, you know, these are, these are really real, real issues for us about when do you, well, you know, what do you do when you go out? Um, and, you know, I think you have to assume that people around you are infectious and that you may or may not be, you know, part of that 5% that have failed. So when do we start um, acting like there is herd immunity? Do we just continue to wait for advice from, from county? I mean, I think probably by the summer, by the late summer. But you watch, watch what'll happen. People will wanna see your vaccine card to let you into a restaurant or into the movies or onto an airplane, right? We're gonna end up segregating by who has a vaccine card and who doesn't. But so that, that's my real prediction of the sociologic fallout from all this. Don't lose it. That's my advice to you, Laurel. <laughs> um, is there, is it worth getting an antibody test to see if you're one of the failed um, vaccine recipients after you've gotten the vaccine? No, we'll figure that out later. We may, we may do another round of vaccination. Who knows? It's, it's, it's all that stuff's all up in the air right now. And how effective if you get the first dose of a two dose vaccine, um, how effective is that against the virus before you get your second dose? What the filings from Moderna and Pfizer said was that they had, they thought the vaccine was 50% effective after the seven days after the first dose. Somehow it's gotten reported that it's 80% effective. That's, I don't find that in the filings. They say 50%. Um, the, um, uh, the upshot of this is, is that one dose, you're insufficiently protected after one dose. Now, what I can tell you is that there is some protection. There are some not insubstantial protection. 50% efficacy is pretty good, right? Um, that's just not great, but it's not bad. Um, what uh, the, but the, 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 the point that we, where we can give a little bit is about the distance between the two vaccines. 
So in England, for instance, where they have this horrendous problem with this rapidly transmitting strain, they're putting all the vaccine into southeastern England or a lot of the vaccine into southeastern England, into Kent and, and you know, the home counties, as they're fond of calling them, right? And they're taking a chance that they'll get enough for a second dose at the right time. But if they don't, there's actually quite a bit of flexibility on when you get the second dose. Now, having said that, I have absolutely no intention of getting this, my second dose anything more than tw exactly 21 days after I got the first one. Uh, so you shouldn't, you know, uh, this is going to be a kind of a supply thing, but unless there's a massive outbreak that we're trying to suppress, like for instance, this variant outbreak in San Diego County, um, I don't think there's any reason to, to stop after one or, or to try and stretch your, stretch the interval between the two. Which do you think is the better course of action going to get more people vaccinated with the first dose um, and then, uh, or, or fewer people with both doses or can those be achieved simultaneously? There's, it seems to be that there's, a, there's an issue with rolling out the doses, um, the vaccine in general, and with two doses, it makes it even more logistically complicated. It's a manufacturing issue and the, and the manufacturing capacity is vast. Um, you know, it's, this stuff is pretty, pretty easy to make. I, I will say that's not, not quite that easy to make, uh, but the, all the capacity is there. So that's easy to ramp up. I agree with the, you know, president elect's uh, decision to release the national stockpile. So they were holding back a whole bunch of vaccine to give people a second dose, but, you know, we're not going to get through this unless we get a lot of people vaccinated. And I think if you had to err on the side of, uh, you know, on the side of, of, of the, uh, you know, the good versus the perfect, the good is to get every, is to get one dose into everybody and then get the second dose as rapidly as possible after that. But I think there's gonna be plenty to do it the right way. So the answer to your question is yes and yes. You know, instead of making a choice, I'm gonna say yes to both. Um, so where is the lag in getting people vac vaccinated? It's just in having manpower boots on the street to, to administer the vaccine? and sites and, you know, and distribution systems and getting the patients there and, you know, all those things. Because you can't just, you know, you can't do it like Florida. You can't bring in everybody from Piedmont and put them on the playground at Havens and let them mill around and drink coffee and, you know, and then kind of come out one at a time because there'll be transmission in that, set, in that situation. That's exactly what you can't do. So you have to have like schedules, right? And have, see everybody three minutes. And then you got to hold them for 15 minutes afterwards to make sure they don't get sick, they don't anaphylax. So the logistics of this are not simple, and um, it's going to take big spaces um, uh, to do it, or relatively few people coming through at a time. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we don't go to a 24-hour a day system to try and get as many people vaccinated as possible. So for, for those of us who are lower on the list and have a while to wait before we can receive the vaccine, how protected are we if we are conscientious mask wearers? Very. You're very protected, but you got to do more than wear a mask. You got to, uh, you have to avoid situations like Regent Street on, on the Saturday night before Christmas. You got to avoid situations like that. Um, and uh, you have to avoid crowds and you have to maintain physical distancing from, from other people. And if you go into situations in which you really can't maintain physical distancing, like getting on an airplane, make sure you wear glasses as well. If you don't really wear glasses, you can wear sunglasses and look like you're ultra cool from, from California. But that's what I tell my kids. So a lot of transmission goes through the eyes. And there was a study done in China, this is my new favorite study, where they looked at risk factors for hospitalization in, um, in a big city in Hubei province, which is where Wuhan is. And the um, uh, people who had myopia, right, were 13 times less likely to show up in the hospital with a diagnosis than people who didn't. And that meant they were wearing glasses all day long. Um, and because uh, it, it protects the eyes from... Um, you know, from spray and stuff. So you wear those, you see those idiotic football coaches and wearing those big masks, maybe those big face shields and no masks. That's not the way to do it. 
although that's the point of wearing the, the, the face shield, it's to keep the stuff out of your eyes. But you can do that just as well, just simply by wearing glasses. Um, we're, we're at five o'clock. I have one or two more questions. Are you okay for a yeah, couple minutes? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if you have the option of one vaccine or the other, is the allergic reaction to them the same? Is there a benefit to one over, over the other? No, I mean, one you can get in three weeks and one you can get in four weeks, but aside from that, no, and nobody's going to give you the choice. You, 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 here's your choice. You get it, you don't get it. That's the choice, right? And you can imagine where I come down on that equation. <laughs> Got it. Um, so final question about the efficacy of the vaccine. Um, so I guess there are some studies in other countries like Brazil where the efficacy is lower than what we are saying that it mm -hmm. is. Is there any any chance that that the efficacy of these vaccines will end up being less than what we are expecting it to be based on the trials? I think it's unlikely. I mean, you know, understand that Brazil is a tropical country and this, the, these, the Pfizer vaccine at least is so exquisitely, you know, the storage of it's complicated, right? Um, and uh, so I, I'm not surprised, uh, but I would, you know, you know, you never know until you know, right? And I think what, you know, watch when we get to about 20% of people vaccinated, we'll start to see transmission go down. It'll change the R sub E, that effective reproductive number. That will start to go down when we get about 20% of people vaccinated. Um, and we'll get start getting, you start seeing the impact of, of you know, partial herd immunity right around 20, 25%. Um, and you know, that's when we'll know that this stuff's really working. One, right now, we're at about 3% of people vaccinated, so don't hold your breath. <laughs> One final question, which is related to that. So uh, when can we safely do things like go to a wedding with our family, a large family and extended group of friends? A, a, a large family of anti-vaxxers in Sonoma County on the beach? Is that what you're asking me? <laughs> I mean, it depends. Any, any it's general, all, any general. It's all, it's all dependent, you know, what, you know, if, if I were the mother of the bride, I would insist that people be vaccinated to come. Okay. No vax, no come, you know? And, and I, I think you can, if you do it late enough in the fall, late enough into the, in the summer and early fall, that everybody will, who, who wants to get vaccinated will have had a chance to get vaccinated. Um, I, I think it's as simple as that. You don't want to turn your, I, I once had to do, uh, when I worked for CDC, and this is not the California Department of Corrections, this is the real CDC. I once had to do a, an outbreak of a hepatitis, huge hepatitis A outbreak at a country club in, in Kentucky that was right across the river from Cincinnati. And there were two events. One was a high school sports banquet with, 10, with 1,000 people and 200 cases of hepatitis A from contaminated salad. But the next day was a wedding. And I had to talk to the mother of the bride to get the guest list from her, man. She was unhappy, <laughs> to, put that, to put it mildly. You don't want that to be you. Um, so no super spreaders, no rose garden repeat, okay? That's it. Good advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Rutherford, for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. I'll, I'll see you all around the yard. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Good to see you. Okay. See you, Jennifer. Take care. Okay. Thank you, George.